So, uh, good morning, everyone, uh, and uh, welcome back. Uh, and we're going to continue for, on the Anapanasati Sutta, this discourse on the mindfulness of uh, breathing. Uh, we have kind of done just the introductory part, uh, how to establish the mind uh, and uh, also the body, for that matter, uh, and so as to enable this meditation to work properly. And as I mentioned yesterday, uh, this is maybe in some ways the most important part uh, of this sutta. And the reason is because, as I have mentioned several times, the meditation practice is largely automatic. You just sit back, you kind of allow the breath to develop according to its own nature. Uh, and your job is just to observe that development and just kind of go with the flow uh, and enjoy the process. Uh, and for that reason, because it is an largely an automatic process, how we get started matters uh, enormously because if you haven't got the start right, uh, the process is not going to unfold uh, in the right way here. So getting that uh, initial conditions correct are, is very important. Uh, so now we're going to look at um, how the process actually okay. unfolds. Uh, and uh, we're going to look at uh, uh, the 16 steps of Anapanasati. Uh, uh, four times four, uh, and each one of these uh, groups of four relates to one of the Satipatthana practices. Yeah, Satipatthana, the mindfulness meditation, so however you want to translate it. Uh, uh, so it, it's kind of there's a direct relationship between mindfulness of breathing uh, and uh, Satipatthana practice. So, so um, let's so then after you have established this, uh, mindfulness in front of you. Uh, then it says here, just mindful, you breathe in, mindful, you breathe out. Uh, so this is where it begins, uh, right? Uh, and um, there's a little word there that is kind of interesting, and uh, the, the little word just, uh, and this is, uh, may it's important not to kind of read too much into the Pali, it's easy to kind of see meaning where maybe there is no meaning, uh, and the Pali word is just this tiny little word, eva in Pali, translated here as just. And, uh, but it may be significant. And when you know the overall context of the idea that you are just supposed to be mindful, uh, that it is an automatic process, uh, then the idea of just, uh, I suggest, and I think this is a reasonable interpretation, is that it means all you have to do is to be mindful. Uh, there's no particular uh, effort that is required, uh, there's no particular intention that is required. Uh, all you have to do is kind of sit back and allow that mindfulness, uh, that awareness, that attentiveness on the breath to do its job. Uh, yeah, small little word, but it kind of fits with the context of the suttas overall, uh, that this is how the process happens. It's an automatic process. Uh, and we are the passengers on the train. Uh, is one of Ajahn Brahm's memorable similes, and it's, it's a nice one, yeah, because when you are on the passenger on the train, uh, you don't have much say over where you're going here. Yeah? Yeah? You don't have much say of the scenery. If the scenery, if you go through the city, you see concrete. Uh, if you go through the countryside, you see grass and cows. Uh, if you go through kind of, uh, I don't know what else, some bad or good things, yeah, it's, you have to take the bad and the good, uh, depending on uh, the situation. Uh, and uh, in a sense, we are on this journey where we sit back and we are observers. Uh, we are like passengers on the train. Uh, and we don't go up into the kind of uh, front of the train and tell the driver what to do. Yeah, slow down, driver. I want to see the scenery a bit more. Uh, you probably get kicked out very quickly if you <laughs> try to do that. Uh, um, and maybe if it's a very amenable driver, he's oh yeah, the scenery is quite nice here. Let's slow down a bit. Uh, actually, you have to be... Um, anyway, I wouldn't recommend that. Uh, uh, so that is uh, this idea of being the passenger rather than the driver of your meditation practice uh, that kind of comes out here. Just mindful, you breathe in. Uh, just mindful, uh, actually it doesn't say just in the second one, mindful, you breathe out. Uh. And then we begin on the uh, uh, 16 steps. Uh, I'll read out the first four and we can discuss them in a bit of detail uh, straight away afterwards. Uh. So, breathing in heavily, they know I'm breathing in heavily. Breathing out heavily, they know I'm breathing out heavily. Breathing in lightly, they know I'm breathing in lightly. Uh, 
breathing out lightly, they know I'm breathing out lightly. Yeah. They practice like this. Yeah. I'll breathe in, experiencing the whole body. Yeah. They practice like this. I'll breathe out, experiencing the whole body. Yeah. They practice like this. I'll breathe in, stilling the physical process. process. Yeah. I'll practice like this. I'll breathe out, stilling the physical process. Yeah. So um, here we have what is then equivalent to the Kaya Nupassana in the Satipatthana Sutta. Kaya Nupassana means quite literally observing the body or contemplating the body. So here the breath is that body that you contemplate. Yeah, so it's kind of, uh, we'll see this later on as well, that the idea, the breath, is considered a body here, in the broader sense of body. Body in English really means a collection of things, right? In the kind of broader meaning of that word. Uh, and here it has that sense of a collection of phenomena uh, collected together into a group. And this group is called a body here. And uh, the breath is one such group. Uh, and uh, the physical body is another group. Uh, and the word kaya in Pali is actually used very broadly here. Uh, it does not just mean physical body. Yeah. And this is a very important point, because if you get that wrong, yeah, you're going to have a lot of misinterpretation of the suttas. Yeah. Um, uh, kaya is often opposed to citta or vijnana. Vijnana is the consciousness, yeah. and the body can be regarded as the personality. Yeah. Yeah, there are other aspects of mind. Yeah. Consciousness itself is just awareness. Awareness doesn't have much personality to it. It's just being aware. The personality resides in our willing, how we will in the world. Our personality resides in how we experience the world, yeah? the perceptions that we have, how we feel the world. The body that we have obviously has to do with personality because we all look a bit different. This is where the personality resides. And Kaya can actually quite well be translated as personality here. Yeah. And that works very well in a large number of places in the suttas. Uh. In some cases that personality has mostly got to do with the physical body, so in those cases uh, it becomes close to the meaning of physical body. Uh. But in other cases uh, it uh, uh, does not, cannot remotely be uh, related to the physical body. Uh. And we may see some examples of this later on. Uh. <coughs> Uh, here also we see that kaya means, uh, has a broader kind of meaning. Uh, it means like a heap of things, a group of things. And the group here is actually the breath. Uh. So, breathing in heavily, the Pali word is diga. Diga literally means long. Uh, so in Pali it is the long breath. Uh, here, heavily, heavy breath might be maybe a little bit more idiomatic in English. Uh, I'm not really sure. Uh, but uh, that's what the translator here reckons, uh, and that's why he has put heavily rather than longer. So uh, I guess that doesn't really make all that much difference. Uh, so you breathe in long, uh, you know that I'm breathing in long or breathing in heavy. Uh. So what does that mean in specifically? Does it mean that we should focus on the length of the breath? Uh, or what does it actually mean? Uh, and I don't think it really necessarily means that. It just means that you focus on the breath, but that it is the nature of the breath to be long, usually, when you start out. If you are mindful and you are clear yeah, and you're reasonably relaxed, the breath initially will be fairly long. Yeah? You're breathing in a long, relaxed breath. And then as you calm down, you will need a little bit less oxygen. As you calm down, the breath becomes a little bit shorter. So there is this kind of natural sequence of the breath being long to begin with and then being shorter after a while. So I think this is just focusing on the nature of the breath, yeah, rather than actually on what we are necessarily observing. Of course, if you are attending carefully, you may notice that the breath gets shorter. But that is not really the main issue here. You don't actually have to attend to the length of the breath. It is just that this is how the breath tends to develop when you do the meditation. And this is kind of an important point because sometimes you find people who interpret this to mean that you should control the breath so that it is long initially and then it becomes shorter. But that would definitely be to go against the whole idea of the meditation here. Certainly should not control it. Uh, you should just be aware of what is happening here. So the question then is, well, where are we aware of this breath? Uh, 
previously we saw the idea of uh, establishing mindfulness in front of you. Uh, and the Pali for that is uh, something parimukkam upatapetva. Uh, something is mindfulness, right? Uh, upatapetva means to establish. Uh, and parimukkam is here the critical word. Uh, what does that exactly mean? Uh, and you will know, go, know that in many uh, meditation centers they will tell you to feel the breath at the tip of the nose or the upper lip or in this area somewhere. Uh, and the reason why they say that is because uh, this word parimukkam is interpreted uh, in the commentaries uh, as nas anga, nas anga. Nasa is nose, right? Just like in English. Nasa, nose. French, ne. In uh, Polish, what is it in Polish? I'm not sure. <laughs> um, in Norwegian, nes. Uh, this is one of my language I know. German, what is it in German again? Nasa, there you are, right? Nasa, thank you. So you can see all of these languages are related, Pali related, right? Nasa is the, uh, the nose. Uh, Agga is the tip. So you have the tip of the nose. And uh, so for that reason, when you go to meditation centers, because they all use the commentaries to interpret the suttas, actually they will say, watch it at the tip of the nose. But uh, the word parimukkang, when you look at it in the suttas, it's never really clearly defined in this way. And in fact, it does not really seem to be as specific as that. Uh, it's more the sense of presence, yeah, awareness, uh, the physical and the time presence, here and now, if you like. Yeah. And uh, in many ways, I think it is useful in the beginning, when you start out, not to, uh, uh, not to uh, pin it down so specifically as the tip of the nose. Because if you do that, it can easily become a little bit too narrow, and that can maybe make you tense again. But to have a more kind of open awareness of the breath, uh, without having any specific physical location. Uh. So when you are breathing, yeah, you just know the breath is going in, the breath is going out. Um. And it doesn't matter where or how you know that, as long as you know that. Uh, that is what matters. Uh. So. Uh, this is also how I have learned meditation from Ajahn Brahm. This is what he always recommended, and I found that to be very useful. And I think actually it matches very well with the recommendation right here in the Sutta. Establishing mindfulness in front of you, right, in the here and the now. I think that is probably as, uh, as good as a translation can get. Uh, and uh, uh, what is interesting about the commentarial idea of pinpointing at the tip of the nose uh, is that as your meditation develops uh, and you actually try to look at where is it that you experience the breath, yeah? as your mindfulness becomes strong, you will sit very often you do actually experiencing it precisely at the tip of the nose. Uh, so the commentarial interpretation does not necessarily, it's not necessarily a prescription on what we should be doing here, but possibly just a description of what is actually happening here. So uh, in that sense, it may actually be correct. Uh, yeah? it's, it's all a matter of uh, interpreting the commentaries, interpreting the interpretation. Uh, <laughs> it gets complicated. It's hard to know sometimes exactly what is going on. Uh. So um, this is uh, what... Uh, I would recommend a kind of open awareness of the breath. You're not too pinned down at this point. And just aware of the breath. Don't worry about long or short, just be aware of the breath. And then the reality is that it is long. Then, as you practice, it becomes shorter just by the development of the breath. So, you know this, right? You notice the word know. In the next phrase it says, they practice like this. So the, word, the development is from knowing to practicing. Yeah. So what is that all about? And again, it is a matter of interpretation, but I would say it starts off with knowing because you are already mindful. So the knowledge happens straight away. Yeah, you don't have to do a lot of meditation for this knowledge to happen. It is immediate because your mindfulness is already there. But then, if you want to be aware of the whole breath or the whole body, which is the next stage, it takes practice. It takes time. What is that practice? 
And again, it is not actually you doing anything in particular. That you don't actually have to exert your mind or intend anything in particular. You just have to allow the process to happen. And as the process happens, you become your awareness expands. You become more mindful because things are calming down. The thinking mind becomes even more refined or or, or even more calmed down. And so your awareness becomes broader. And this is how you then are able to be aware of the whole body, as it says here. What does it say again? It says, uh, then practice like this. I will breathe in experiencing the whole body. Sabbakaya patisang vedi is the Pali. And so what, again, this is quite interesting, right? Whole body. What does it mean? We are doing breath meditation. Sabba kaya. Sabba is whole. Kaya is body in Pali. So what does it actually refer to? And in some meditation traditions they will say it actually refers to the whole physical body. Gwenka tradition says that, for example. And uh, okay, uh, maybe, I'm not saying it necessarily is completely wrong, but uh, I would argue that the most natural interpretation here is that it means the whole breath rather than the whole physical body. Yeah. And uh, one reason for that is because we are dealing with breath meditation, right? This is kind of what it is all about. It is called anapanasati, which is breath breathing in and breathing out. So it kind of makes sense that we shouldn't jump around from the physical body to the breath. This is the first thing. Yeah. Second reason I would argue it is about the breath is because it says further down in exactly the same sutta, the same discourse, that the breath is called a body, a body among bodies. And to me that is pretty clear then that we are dealing with the body breath here as well and not the physical body. And the third reason is the commentaries say it means the breath, right, not the uh, the body. Very often the commentaries are on track. We should not dismiss the commentaries easily at all. We should have very good reasons uh, for dismissing the commentaries uh, and we should take them on board, uh, generally speaking, because these were written by people with a lot of meditation experience, uh, people who are often very wise uh, about what the teachings are about. Uh, so uh, we shouldn't dismiss them easily. Uh. Sometimes there is a tendency in Buddhist circles to dismiss the commentaries as if they were written by a bunch of scallywags, but uh, that's obviously not the case, right? Uh, these were often very good people with lots of insight. Uh. So, um, uh, physical body or breath body, I say it is the whole breath. So what is happening here is that whole breath means that you are seeing more of the breath. Uh. As you calm down, you are, your awareness is expanding, maybe you're seeing the beginning, the middle and the end. You're seeing the flow of the breath much more, you're not just seeing a particular point because you get distracted, but you're seeing the whole process of breathing more as you calm down. Yeah? I'm sure you have noticed this sometimes in your own meditation, how your awareness expands in this way. And it's quite delightful already. This meditation gets delightful pretty quickly here, yeah, if you get it right. If you don't get it right, it's a pain, but if you get it right, it can be painful to watch the breath if you use willpower, for example, but once you get on the right track, it becomes very delightful. And so you expand your awareness to see the whole breath. What about interpreting as the body? If some people have this as the preferred interpretation, and maybe some of you have that as well. Maybe you have been going to Gwenka courses, and maybe you think Gwenka has got it right. And uh, if you do, it's okay. Yeah, it's not, it's not really necessarily wrong to focus on the whole body here. Yeah. But uh, the point is that you should use it to deepen the stillness and the peace in the mind. Uh, it should be following, it should actually produce the same kind of results, yeah? You should feel that your mindfulness is getting stronger, yeah? you're getting more peaceful, yeah? it's heading in the right direction, you're enjoying what you're doing, yeah? And then uh, it actually will have largely the same effect as watching the breath. Yeah? And then when you do become more peaceful, when things really go in the right way, then you should come back to the breath again, because the rest of the sutta clearly is about the breath. Yeah? So it can be like a, a small sidestep and then kind of coming back again there. So whatever works really. 
And in many ways, this is kind of the final say in many of these disputes. If it works for you, wonderful. Carry on doing it. Uh, if it doesn't work, try something else and see how you can uh, make this process uh, work for you. Uh, so that is the idea of Sabha Kaya Pati Sang Vedi. Um, so you practice like this, breathing in, experiencing the whole body, they practice like this. Uh, I'll breathe out, experiencing the whole body. They practice like this, I'll breathe in, stilling the physical process. Uh, I'll practice like this, I'll breathe out, stilling the physical process. Uh, and uh, this uh, particular phrase, stilling the physical process, uh, is Kaya Sankarang Pasampati, I think. Yeah. Kaya Sankarang Pasampati. Yeah. And uh, uh, this is related to the word Pasadi I was talking about the other day. Pasadi, which means calm or tranquility. Pasampati is calming or tranquilizing. Yeah, yeah? You're tranquilizing something. Yeah. Again, you're not doing it. Uh, it says you train, that doesn't mean that you're actually doing it, but you're allowing it to happen. In fact, almost all the calming comes from doing less. Yeah? It is the doing that interferes with the calming down of things. Because the doing is the activity of the mind. As long as your mind is active, there is more things going on. The body gets excited, the mind gets excited. So actually it is the opposite of doing it, is the letting go of doing it that makes this process come about. So calming down happens through letting go. What are we calming down? It says here the physical process. What does that mean? Kaya, Sankara. You have this word Kaya again, and then you have the word Sankara. The word Sankara is a very multifaceted word. And it, uh, the kind of the root meaning is something like activity, uh, the activity, yeah, various kind of activities of the body. So here it means something like the activities of the body. Uh, yeah? He has physical process. Uh, activity of the body is another way of thinking about it. Or the activity of the personality maybe. Here body is probably more to the point. Uh, so uh, this Kaya Sankara is actually defined elsewhere in the suttas as the breath, yeah? So we know that this relates to the breath. So, and that, of course, is the main physical activity or the main physical process you have at this point. That is what you are aware of. Yeah, the breath is really what activity. The rest of the body is the sitting there peacefully. Yeah? So this is the main thing. Yeah? So you can take this to mean the calming down of the breath. If there are other parts of the body that are not tranquil, you can include that too in the calming down, yeah? the tranquilizing of things. So you're calming down the breath. Uh, and again, this happens automatically here. Uh, you just stand back, you watch the process happen. Uh, and the more you're able to watch, uh, the more you're able just to stand back, uh, the more you are a passenger on that uh, train, uh, yeah? just enjoying the landscape. And now the landscape is getting beautiful. Uh, the beautiful thing about this train, the ordinary train, you have to kind of deal with whatever landscape. In this train, you are creating the landscape as you go along. That's quite nice, isn't it? The landscape is developing through your ability just to observe. You are the, you're not really creating it, you're allowing it to be created. You're allowing it, it's like a train that always goes to better and better places. Yeah, The more kind of the, the scenery gets better and better. It's like you come out of London, yeah, and you get into the countryside, uh, yeah, and the countryside gets better and better as you come out. Uh. <laughs> so something like that. Uh. So uh, uh, this is the idea of uh, the process, uh, kind of calming down. Now, uh. so these are the first four steps of uh, anapanasati, uh, of mindfulness of breathing, uh, and this is equivalent to the body contemplation in the Satipatthana Sutta, Kaya Nupassana. Yeah, but let me know if I use too many Pali terms. I kind of like to use them because they are, you know, they kind of give you the source in a sense. But if you find it too difficult to follow, please let me know in one of the notes and I will reduce the number of Pali terms. But I try also to translate every time. Kaya Nupassana, contemplation of the body. Yeah. So, Yesterday I said that contemplation of the body is mostly about the 31 parts of the body. Here we are talking about uh, contemplation of the breath. 
Yeah? So these are the two, if you like, alternative ways uh, of doing it. Uh, which one should we focus on? Uh, should we do one or the other? Should we do both? Uh, and, uh, and the answer is that if the process of meditation does not unfold as it is supposed to be, uh, very often that comes is, is because uh, there is some attachment. Yeah, There's always attachments that stop us from going deeper. We're holding on to something. Uh, and one of the basic things that we hold on to is the body and the five senses. Uh, yeah, some people have told me they kind of they meditate, and when you do your meditation, you will you know sometimes the parts of the body will disappear. Maybe you can't feel your hands anymore, or the more of the body starts to disappear. And sometimes people are concerned about that. Yeah, my hands were disappearing. Yeah, what is going on? Help! <laughs> right? It's kind of it's we are so sometimes so attached to the body that even a little bit of dis disappearing feels uh, uncomfortable for us. Uh. So the purpose of the contemplation of the body, it can sometimes go in conjunction with watching the breath. Uh. If you don't like to do the 31 parts, uh, yeah, you don't have to do the 31 parts, uh, but you can do like the element contemplation, uh, it's a bit more neutral. Uh. The 31 parts, you're kind of confronted with uh, parts of your body maybe you'd rather not know about. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh. The body is not, the body is kind of uh, not all that beautiful when you kind of take off the, some of the external layers. Uh. Yeah, it's uh, fascinating. I, I mentioned this many times. Uh, I often mention this, but I, there was this famous German uh, man called Günther von der Hagen. It sounds very German, doesn't it? Uh, Günther von der Hagen. <laughs> and he was, uh, he was famous for this special technique of preserving dead bodies. Uh, some of you have probably heard of this. As I know some of you have, actually. And he had this exhibition called Körperwelten, or something like that, which means body worlds in English. And uh, in this exhibition, he had treated these dead bodies in such a way that they, they were kept, yeah, in kind of a good... Had, somehow he had drained the water from the bodies and, and substituted some kind of silicon or something like that. So the bodies were actually kept intact for long, long periods of time. Uh, and then he would have all these dead bodies uh, and he would take them around the world. <laughs> <laughs> some, some kind of mad scientist or something and we kind of had, I don't know how he travelled with these dead bodies around the world he put them in the cargo on the plane or something and took them around anyway he, that's what he did and then he, one of the places he took them was to Australia to Perth of all places and it happened that just as he was having his exhibition in Perth we had, we had a Buddhist convention next door <laughs> So we were saying, oh yeah, okay, let's check out this Body World exhibition, right? <laughs> it was kind of all happening at the same time. It was some kind of weird coincidence, but anyway. And so we went to look at these dead bodies. And when you take the body here and you remove the skin, yeah, you realize how important the skin is for the attractiveness of the body. <laughs> this thin layer makes an enormous amount of difference. And take that off, and it becomes, it's all, it's all right, we can still deal with it, but it's, it certainly doesn't attract you in the same way <laughs> as before. <laughs> and so that's kind of fascinating. Yeah? And uh, sometimes I like to do that, I kind of like to kind of peel the skin off my own face. Uh, and it's kind of, kind of interesting when you do that. Yeah? And uh, so that is one way of doing this contemplation of the body, seeing the body, not getting averse to the body, not having a sense of ill will or negativity towards the body, but having a bit more neutrality towards it, a bit more coolness towards it. Uh, and this is the idea. If some people I know have a problem with their body, they have kind of an aversion to the body, so if you have that already, uh, and you kind of have a bit of self-hate, please don't do this kind of thing, if that's already the case. Uh, but if you have an ordinary feeling of your body and you kind of are attracted a bit to bodies like most people are, then it, this can be useful. Now, a more neutral way of doing this is to do the four element contemplation. And that is just the idea that the body has a hardness, it has a, a, a watery factors, it has air factors, and it has heat. You have the four kind of elements, they seem to have been a, common idea throughout the ancient world, the idea of the four elements, uh, and just the realization that the elements in the body are the same as the external elements. Uh, the body arises from external elements, and it goes back to external elements. Uh, there's nothing very personal about it. We are built up out of the nature around us. Uh, so how interesting can it be here? Uh, it actually says, <laughs> I'm not supposed to laugh, this is serious. <laughs> no. 
And it, what is the sense of that? It? Is the body is built out of porridge and gruel or something like that. Yeah? <laughs> and that, of course, comes from the external environment. Uh, so these are nice ways of neutralizing some of the uh, uh, some of our attachment to the body here, yeah? and this can go hand in hand with the breath. Uh, yeah, so you do the breath, and if it doesn't really work all that well, if you come across obstacles, uh, and you find that you are attached some attachments, uh, and these things can be used, but you don't have to. And this is the point: uh, you can actually use mindfulness or breathing all the way, uh, and it will take you all the way here. Uh. You don't have to go into these other things uh, unless you need them specifically here. So uh, that is the uh, uh, body contemplation uh, according to this. Uh, and now we will move on to the contemplation of uh, feelings. Uh, right? Uh, uh, this is the second part of four aspects of the Anapanasati Sutta that relates to contemplation of feelings in the Anapana, in the Satipatthana Sutta, the Vedana Nupasana. And uh, so this is how, what it reads like in the Anapanasati Sutta. They practice like this. Uh, I will breathe in experiencing rapture. Uh, the practice like this, I will breathe out experiencing rapture. The practice like this, I will breathe in experiencing bliss. The practice like this, I will breathe out experiencing bliss. The practice like this, I will breathe in experiencing mental processes. The practice like this, I will breathe out experiencing mental processes. The practice like this, I will breathe in stilling the mental processes. The practice like this, I will breathe out, stilling the mental processes. So uh, here, the last one here, you can again see this idea of stilling things. Yeah, Just like previously we had the idea of stilling the bodily or the physical process, uh, here we have the idea of stilling the mental process. Uh, and later on, when we come down to the mind, we have the idea of stilling the mind. Uh, and uh, so this is one of the themes of meditation that you see again and again. The idea of everything stilling, uh, calming down. And this is one of the ways, uh, one of the uh, kind of uh, clues to whether your meditation is going right or not. Uh, are things becoming more still? Uh, and if things are becoming more still, you know that you are basically on the right track. Uh, stillness is one of the indicators uh, that mindfulness and the meditation is going well. Uh, there are a number of uh, indicators like that. Uh, stillness is one. Uh, joy is another. You can see here we are really coming into the area of happiness. We're talking about rapture. We're talking about bliss. Uh, yeah, so a de uh, at first of all, the arising of joy in the mind and then the deepening of that joy. Uh, more peaceful, more powerful aspects of happiness as you go deeper and deeper in your meditation. Uh, these are two of the main things, the two of the main indicators uh, that your meditation is going well. Uh, the bliss is getting better uh, and the peace is getting better. Uh, deeper and more profound and more enjoyable as you go further and further in this practice. Uh, that is kind of useful to recognize, right? Uh, because we need some of these uh, signposts on the way into samadhi. Uh, how do we know we are on the right track? Well, these are some of the indicators. Uh, and uh, interestingly, these are the indicators used by the Buddha throughout the suttas. Uh, yeah? Stilling uh, and uh, bliss. Uh, stilling and happiness. Uh, deepening of those two things is what actually is happening here. There are other indicators as well. Uh, uh, the energy of the mind is one of them. Uh, the degree of mindfulness is another. Uh, the degree of clarity you have, your ability to see what is happening in your mind is another one. Uh, but the two that really kind of stand out all the time uh, is uh, the depth of joy and happiness uh, and the depth of the peace that you are experiencing here. And here we're starting to see this. Uh, but it starts out with breathing in heavily, they know, sorry, uh, they practice like this, I'll breathe in experiencing rapture. Uh, rapture, the Pali word for rapture is uh, piti. Uh, yeah, and it is a very uh, important word in the suttas, and it is a, a necessary aspect of the meditation practice. Uh, so we should, you know, we should kind of see this as a, another signpost on the way into deep meditation. Uh, and it is translated here as rapture, which I think is a good translation. Uh, the idea of rapture is like a kind of a 
powerful kind of happiness, yeah, rapturous happiness. Uh, and often it can be felt both physically and mentally, yeah. yeah. Sometimes it can be felt like almost like waves of happiness going through the body. It can be felt like almost like electricity or something like that. Uh, like some, it can be part of a physical, physical sensation and also a mental sensation. Uh, and very, it gets very, the meditation has to get very enjoyable when you start to get to these kind of feelings. Uh, yeah, this is the sort of thing that we live for, experience a deep sense of joy. Uh, this is what life is all about, right? Uh, and you're starting to feel at this point uh, that you're moving towards the meaning of life itself. If this is what meditation can give, uh, if this is what the spiritual path has on offer, uh, then clearly it is more interest than almost anything else in life. Uh, you're here approaching something that really matters very deeply, in a very deep sense. Uh, you're feeling that, okay, now you have finally getting uh, where you wanted to be all along. Uh, the world was promising happiness and joy uh, yeah, in various kind of ways, uh, and you can never really find it in the world. Uh, the world just kind of went on and on. There was new things, and the previous joys kind of disappeared, and you were seeking new ones. Uh, it never really delivered in any real way. Uh, now you're finally finding that delivery uh, that you have been looking for all along. Uh, I'll talk more about this later, this distinction between the worldly happiness, the worldly joys, uh, and the joys of the mind, the joys of meditation, because it's a very important distinction. Uh, and one of the main differences is that the worldly happiness uh, always tends to involve craving, even while you are enjoying it, uh, but certainly in the long run as you're seeking it again and again. Uh, the spiritual happiness is always deal with the peace of the mind, the craving dying down, uh, the elimination of the desires. Uh, it's a very different feel to it, far more satisfactory. It has to do with contentment and real satisfaction. You're finally finding this thing yeah, that you were looking for all along. Yeah. And that's kind of extraordinary. Yeah. And this is why this has to do with the very meaning of life. Yeah. So, rapture, right? It can be experienced in these ways. And the, if you want to read about the various ways of rapture can be experienced, it is actually mentioned, talked about in the Visuddhimagga in a bit of detail. The Visuddhimagga, the path of purification, uh, one of these kind of uh, uh, seminal works of the Theravada tradition. Uh, and it has a lot of interesting material. I must have to confess straight away, I haven't really read uh, the Visuddhimagga in detail or fully. I have read tiny bits of pieces here and there. Uh, uh, but uh, people say it, they, there are interesting bits in there. There are bits also that may not be so interesting and that are outrightly boring, to be honest. Uh, but uh, <laughs> that's just the way it goes sometimes, and some may even be misleading. Uh, but uh, there are interesting bits. Uh, but if you haven't read all the suttas yet, read all the suttas first. Uh, if you've read all the suttas once, uh, read them a second time. Uh, if you read them a second time, read them a third time. Uh, <laughs> when you read all the suttas ten times, then maybe go to the Vasudhi Manga. Uh, that's my uh, kind of uh, recommendation here. Uh. So um, now we want to go to the rapture. So how do we make that transition uh, from being aware of the breath uh, to experiencing rapture? Uh? And this is kind of important. And uh, the way to make that transition, sometimes it happens naturally. Yeah, yeah you are, uh, the breath is going well, you're enjoying yourself, and suddenly kind of the joy and the happiness just arise in the mind. Uh, they come in various degrees. Sometimes it's kind of fairly faint, kind of gladness of the mind. Uh, and it strengthens into this rapturous feeling. Yeah, It kind of go goes, has a natural process to it. Uh, but sometimes people find it hard, yeah? they can't find, find the peace with the breath, uh, but actually they're not able to make that leap into the joy and the rapture. Uh. So how can we encourage that? Uh, how, how can we actually make that work? Uh? And this is uh, some of the things I was talking about yesterday. Uh, at this point, because we're already getting peaceful, we don't want to uh, do anything that uh, disturbs the mind too much. Uh, so you want to nudge the mind very gently at this point. Uh, and by nudging the mind, I just mean bringing up a perception. Uh, and these perceptions are the perceptions I talked about yesterday. They become especially useful at this particular point. Uh, the idea of your Kalyana Mittas. Uh, yeah, your good spiritual friends. Uh, wow, I've got all these wonderful spiritual friends. Uh, yeah, it's like a perception. It's not something you have to think very hard about. Uh, it's just this vague memory that you are in good company here, yeah? in the company of the Buddha. Now every one of us is in the company of Buddha because we're reading his words. Uh, 
you're in the company of something very positive, uh, something in the world which makes the world a better place and makes us better as individual human beings. Uh, it's really what a wonderful thing that is. Uh, you are in the company of the Dhamma. Yeah, these teachings that uh, are the most important teachings, uh, the most important written works uh, in the history of the world. Uh, people like to read Shakespeare and they have the Buddha. Isn't that kind of, uh, why read Shakespeare when you have the Buddha? Okay, you can read Shakespeare if you want, please do so, but the Buddha should be read much more, right? Uh, this is the real deal. The Shakespeare, okay, maybe it's nice, maybe, they, no doubt there are some nice insights there, and it's nice and poetic, and it's kind of good fun, and you go to see the plays and whatever, but uh, this, is the, this is about the meaning of life. Uh, Shakespeare doesn't give you the meaning of life, uh, the Buddha does. Uh, this is the most important text in the history of the world. Uh, there's nothing like it. Uh, you are in the presence of that. Uh, wow! This is kind of how you feel. Uh, and then there's the Sangha, the Sangha are all the people who practice these teachings and who have the results uh, of these teachings. Yeah, it's, they are still alive. Uh, the Buddhism is not dead, it's a living religion. People are still experiencing these things. Uh, and then you come to the idea of, uh, you know, that you have lived your life well, uh, and just gently kind of incline your mind. Yeah, I'm keeping the five precepts, uh, I'm living my life to the best of my ability, uh, I'm trying to be a kind and caring person, uh, actually I'm doing pretty well. Uh, and you feel a sense of joy and happiness, a sense of uplift, uh, because you know that you're living your life in a good way. Uh, yeah? These are the ideas uh, that kind of can help the mind to move towards this kind of joy. Uh, you're lifting the mind up a little bit. It is not too dry. We don't want dry inside, we want wet inside. Uh, this is the wetness, right? The piti, the pamoja, the gladness, the rapture. This is the wetness of meditation. Uh, it's crazy, I don't know why anyone wants to have dry insight when you can have wet insight. Uh, <laughs> right? Uh, this is what kind of makes it nice. This is what makes it wonderful. This is what makes it really worthwhile. Uh, of course we should practice in this way, not the least, because the Buddha says this is the path to awakening. Uh, this Piti we're talking about now is one of the factors of awakening. Yeah? The Piti Sambhojanga, the awakening factor of Piti. Yeah? Yeah, if you put the um, seven factors of awakening, you put them next to the Anapanasati Sutta, you can see the sequences are the same. We are effectively now practicing the factors of awakening when we come to Piti right here. Yeah? You're on that path. So this is how you, if you have problems, how you bring about that joy and rapture in the mind, yeah, at this particular point. Uh, and this is where these ideas kind of uh, come into their own and where they are become very useful. Yeah? But it doesn't stop there. Uh, the next thing it says is that I will breathe in experiencing bliss. Uh, I will practice like this, breathe out experiencing bliss. Uh, the Pali word for bliss is sukha, and sukha just means happiness in a very kind of general sense. Uh, so the, it is contextual, the contextual meaning is very important, uh, but here it means a very profound mental experience of happiness. So bliss is really a good translation. Uh, one of the things about translating the word of the Buddha is to understand the contextual meaning of words, uh, that they mean different things in different contexts. Uh, just like in English, right? You have a word has slightly different meanings depending on how you use it and where you use it. Uh, and so for that reason, uh, uh, it is important not always to translate the word in exactly the same way in all contexts. Uh, because if you do that, you lose the meaning of the Pali. Uh, contextual meaning is very important. Uh, and I believe that words should be translated differently in different contexts. Uh, a good dictionary will give you the different meanings according to different contexts. Uh, and there are some very good dictionaries available today. One of the main uh, dictionary writers into English is an English lady called Margaret Cohn, uh, and she has been working on these dictionaries for a long time. She almost spent her whole life doing these dictionaries. Uh, I don't know, is that a good idea to spend a whole life doing a dictionary? Uh, yeah, if you, I guess if you enjoy it, and if you're into Pali, and maybe you combine it with uh, experiencing these words, uh, then maybe it's a good idea. Uh, so she has worked in that dictionary, she started in, I think, 1985, and she has been working until very recently, 2020 or something like that, 35 years, just working on this dictionary. Still isn't finished, by the way, but she's getting there. She was better than the other dictionary. There was another dictionary that started back in 1924. It was called the Critical Pali Dictionary. And after about 
60 years that I'm the first letter of the alphabet. Yeah. And then they kind of they decided, okay, we better, we're gonna... <laughs> and then they decided to cancel it because it just took too long. And it probably would have finished in the year 3000 or something if they <laughs> continued at that pace. <laughs> it's just going too slowly. Yeah. So uh, anyway, that's nothing to do with breath meditation. But uh, so sukha, yeah, bliss. Uh, it is more profound than the previous one. You have the piti, the rapture, and you have the sukha, which is a more calm kind of bliss. Uh, yeah, so you're calming down, it becomes even more peaceful, even more delightful. Yeah. So that is the process again that we should look for, calm and greater kind of bliss. It becomes more mental at this point as well, because rapture can have a kind of physical component, which the bliss, the sukha, doesn't really have in this particular way. Yeah. Then it says you practice experiencing um, the mental processes, and the mental processes here is that bliss, right? That's really what it is, uh, and whatever else is, might be happening in your mind at that time, but mainly it refers to that particular bliss that you are experiencing. Yeah? Uh, so you are experiencing those mental processes. Uh, uh, citta sankharam, citta sankharam, no, not experience. That, that's calming, yeah. Pasambhaya. Patisambhaya, I think, yeah. yeah. And then Pasambhaya will be the next one. Yeah. So you are experiencing the mental process season. Uh, so there's more place again, right? More of the same. And then the last one then is the stilling of the mental process, which, which is Pasambhayang uh, or Pasambhati, as uh, Rambachanda is rightly saying. Yeah. So you're stilling the Chitta Sankara. So you're stilling the mind, uh, yeah? Stilling and bliss, one thing coming after the other. Yeah. So now this is the equivalent uh, of the uh, second Satipatthana, the Vedana Nupassana. You yeah, have the contemplation of feelings in the Satipatthana Sutta. Yeah. Now what is very interesting about this, uh, if you go to the Satipatthana Sutta, it will say there that you should understand that various kinds of feelings, yeah, the worldly feelings and spiritual feelings, uh, and you should know these two kinds of feelings in three different ways, uh, in terms of happiness, pain, and neither happiness and pain. Uh, right? So painful feelings are included in the Satipatthana Sutta. Uh, and because they are included, uh, when you go to a meditation retreat uh, and you sit down and you have heaps of pain in the body, they will tell you, watch the pain. I don't know if you, any one of you have experienced that, but this is quite a common thing in meditation retreats, especially within certain systems of vipassana meditation. Vipassana is just a marketing term, by the way. It doesn't really mean all that much in these things. So vipassana meditation. And, but here, there is no mention of pain at all, right? So how do we square these two things? How come in the Satipatthana Sutta pain and uh, neither pain nor pleasure is mentioned, neutral feeling is mentioned, whereas here there's only mention of happy feelings? Uh, how can we square this? Uh, and uh, well, the first thing to notice, of course, is that what it obviously means is that it is not necessary to stay with those painful feelings. Because here we are fulfilling all of the Satipatthana while just watching happiness, just watching bliss. That's the first good news, right? No need to watch those blooming painful feelings. Yeah, get them out. Now, isn't that good news? So next time you go to a person who they tell you to watch those feelings, you tell them the Buddha said I should not watch them. Yeah, and they will say, what? <laughs> <laughs> Don't say that, yeah, you might get into trouble, but uh, you can think that if you like. Yeah. So uh, but that is uh, really good news, uh, and it's very interesting news, uh, because it kind of is a very different way from how these things normally are taught. And the reason why so many traditions teach in that way is because of this singular focus on the Satipatthana Sutta. Yeah? Is that and that is a big problem. Now we can start to see why it is such a big problem. It is such a big problem because you're not even aware of these alternative teachings that actually are incredibly important. Where the Buddha says, this is how you do this practice. So by broadening out the understanding of the suttas, it gives you a different ability to think about meditation in a more constructive way. Don't have to deal with painful feelings. Who wants to deal with painful feelings anyway? Why not just go straight to the happiness if you can? That's my kind of meditation. <laughs> yeah, so, so this is then the, uh, it's a very useful thing uh, to, to be aware of. Uh, 
But doesn't that mean that we are foregoing the insight into painful feelings? How can we know painful feelings if we're just dealing with bliss? And of course the answer is that, well, that is precisely how you get to learn painful feelings. The idea that you learn about painful feelings by experiencing them is actually fundamentally flawed. That is just like the tadpole in the water. The tadpole doesn't understand the water while it's in the water. It's only when it becomes a frog and it jumps out. Okay, that was water. Now I know. If you're always enveloped in something, always immersed in something, it's impossible to get the perspective, uh, impossible to get that kind of view to enable you to understand what is going on. Uh, it is when you emerge from pain, that is when you understand pain. Uh, so this is actually a very good way of understanding pain. Uh, the idea of watching it is a bad way of understanding pain. Uh, so this has all the benefits, more happiness, more insight, uh, more, just better all around. Uh, uh, unfortunately, pain is often available straight away, whereas the bliss is not. That's kind of <laughs> one, of the, one of the downsides of this method. Uh, but uh, is, they just try to guide ourselves towards the joy and happiness instead of, you know, towards the pain in this way. Uh, it's such an optimistic message, uh, such a beautiful message from the suttas. Uh, and uh, uh, just by understanding the suttas a little bit more broadly, we can see it in this way. Uh, now you may wonder, how, how come I put myself up as an authority like this? What about all these other people who teach Vipassana? Don't they understand as well? Do I really think that I'm better than all of these people? I don't know if you think that, but you might think that, right? And maybe you would have a point. But remember that some of these traditions yeah, don't necessarily have a very deep understanding of Buddhism. They come from all kind of various kind of sources. Sometimes there are lay people that have devised a certain system and were not really professional meditators that had a business that were the main thing and they did meditation on the side. So that sometimes the reason why they focus exclusively on the Satipatthana Sutta because they haven't really got time to read the suttas. Yeah? They haven't really got that overview of what is going on. So don't think that just because something is an ancient tradition coming out of a particular culture that it is necessarily right. It will have flaws. Of course, things I say too will have flaws because no one is without flaws. But uh, it is important not to kind of overestimate some of these traditions just because they have a certain pedigree or whatever. In the end, the Buddha's tradition is what matters. And that is what we're focusing on now. So that is the uh, uh, contemplation of uh, uh, feelings for you. Uh, and uh, of course now it is starting to become very, very enjoyable. Yeah, when you come to this, uh, it is starting to become really delightful uh, and you really start to know why you are into this. Uh, and um, uh, Next, we are going to look at the contemplation of the mind is coming up next, but we are kind of running out of time a little, there's only five minutes left. I don't really want to get into the contemplation of a mind at this point. I think that will be um, um, not be very useful. Um, so, I guess one of the questions, I suppose, uh, at this point, that I could talk about a little bit, because we've got five minutes uh, left, uh, is the idea here of uh, to what extent is this uh, samatha calm meditation, and to what extent is it vipassana meditation? Uh, and the answer is that it actually is both. Uh, yeah, there is a kind of a general idea in Buddhism that when you do the Anapanasati Sutta, you're doing samatha meditation. Yeah? You're watching the breath and you're calming everything down. And yes, there is a very important samatha calming component to this kind of meditation. Uh, but you are, it is not as if you are not doing vipassana meditation. You're also doing vipassana at the same time. Uh, because vipassana, what does it mean? Uh, well, it is often translated as insight, uh, but really I think a better translation is clear seeing. Uh, insight is too related to wisdom. Yeah? With insight is like the light bulb going on. Wow, now I see, that's insight. Uh, and that's like wisdom. Uh, yeah, you can become wise, you see things uh, in a flash of lightning, as it says in the suttas. Uh, but Vipassana is not quite like that. Uh, 
Vipassana is actually the cause of wisdom. Vipassana is what develops wisdom. What is it that develops wisdom? It is clear seeing. We're seeing the world clearly. In fact, there are examples in the suttas of vipassana or vipassi being used exactly in that way. Someone who is awake, someone who is aware, someone who sees clearly. That is really what that is about. And so clear seeing is a really good translation for vipassana. And I remember writing to Venerable Bikibodhi and I was saying, we've got to get rid of this insight stuff and put clear seeing in there uh, instead. And to my surprise, uh, yeah, because I thought he would kind of reject that straight away, but to my surprise he said, I agree with you, uh, but we've been using insight for so long we are stuck with it, so I'm going to use insight. Uh, that's what he says. Uh, it's a bit of a cop-out, isn't it? Uh, if something is wrong, it's wrong. You should change your translation, for goodness sake. But anyway, that's what he, what he said. Uh, maybe he thought he had to kind of justify too much, had to write too much. I mean, he, he, uh, anyway. So... Um, <laughs> But I, I must admit, I really respect Bhikkhu Bodhi. He's such a senior monk, and he has so much um, experience with translation. And when some kind of young whippersnapper like me <laughs> comes with some suggestion, I, I, I used to be a young whippersnapper, now I'm kind of an old whippersnapper. But anyway, so, so when someone like me comes along, and uh, he actually listens, and he actually takes it seriously, it's kind of, uh, kind of extraordinary here. Yeah. And uh, so he, he is kind of, uh, he has a lot of good qualities in that way. Yeah. So, but anyway, my point is that uh, it needs clear seeing. And of course, if you're calming down in this way, yeah, if you're getting more and more bliss, uh, and you are re obviously reducing your defilements as you are doing this, uh, you, cl you see things more clearly. Yeah. Everything is becoming more clear. So Vipassana and Samatha always develop together. Yeah. And of course then, as you come to the end of the meditation, let's say that you can't go beyond this, you get some bliss, but you don't go into the next stage, which is the contemplation of the mind, you can, at the end of your meditation, yeah, when you come out of this, you can use this as an exercise in contemplation. You can look back on the process that you've been through, and you can gain some more insight, some real insight, by looking back on this process. And this is a very important point of Dhamma, that Samatha and Vipassana always go together. Where there is Samatha, where there is calm, there's also Vipassana, clear seeing. Where there's clear seeing, there's always calm. They have to go together. Because clear seeing means understanding things in the right way. When you understand things in the right way, you will be calm. And when you are calm, you will see things in the right way. These are two aspects, two sides of the same coin. They cannot really be separated. It's not the same, no. Anyway, forget about that. Yeah. So, um, uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is how Samatha and Vipassana uh, work together. It's actually a very important point, because uh, in the modern world people say, okay, this is Samatha meditation, this is Vipassana meditation. Uh, there's nothing in the suttas that divides meditation in that way. There is no samatha meditation, so there's no vipassana meditation. There's only meditation here. And meditation, if done rightly, leads to two things, samatha and vipassana. They are the results of meditation. They are not techniques of meditation here. It's a very important point. If you meditate in the right way, whether you call that vipassana meditation or whether you call it samatha meditation is completely irrelevant. Uh, what matters is that it gives rise to those results that you're looking for. Uh, then it is the right kind of meditation. Uh. Okay, the whole area of samatha vipassana is very interesting yeah, and uh, a very important topic. Yeah. But I have now used up those last five minutes, <laughs> which is good. Huh? So uh, please uh, keep on enjoying yourself, uh, have a nice lunch, uh, and then the Venerable Upeka will be back at, uh, was it 2 or 2.30 today? 2.30. 2.30, so we're staying with 2.30 from now on, uh, and then we will carry on with the pseudo readings after that. Uh.